Uh, hi there, my name is Nick Fountain-Jones and thanks for tuning in from across the world uh, to listen to my talk about emerging phylogenetic structure of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, this is how I pictured myself uh, during the apocalypse, so uh, the picture to your left, but in reality this is probably what I look like, the image to your right. Okay, it's certainly been uh, crazy times. Now this paper, uh, which I'll talk about in this talk, really originated, really started back all the way back in March um, of this year. It seems like a long time ago now. Um, and it's just only just come out in virus evolution uh, as of a couple of um, weeks ago. It's gonna be the basis for this uh, particular talk today, this particular paper, it's freely available. And really to uh, get this all together, I've really uh, relied on these people you see in front of you. Uh, Mark Charleston, which many of you know, uh, Raymer Apoor, which is a PhD student of ours, Scott Carver, all of us from UTAS, as well as people from uh, Imperial College, so Eric Vols and Xavier Didlo from the University of Warwick. Without these fine people, we couldn't have got this uh, paper together. Okay, so I think most of you now got it that understanding viral evolution is, yeah, you know, pretty important, I think. Um, and phylogenetic tools, of course, are crucial to how we uh, control and understand SARS-CoV-2. Of course, um, it's hundreds of papers a day coming out rapidly. There's lots of papers. Some of them have flaws in them, uh, and this can lead to lots of confusion. The media can really amplify uh, some, of this, um, some of this flawed science. So it is quite a confusing uh, subdiscipline to be working in, for sure. And the public are really seeing um, the raw science happening in front of them. Um, what's also remarkable is not just the number of papers, but also the number of genomes uh, published per day that are freely accessible. I think um, GISAID and Next, uh, Next uh, Gen are really up to, I think, 200,000 genomes freely available for anyone across the world to use, which I really think is a remarkable human achievement, 200,000 genomes and counting. Of course, uh, with all these many thousands of genomes, uh, there's a remarkably huge uh, bioinformatic challenge as well. And it's constantly evolving, uh, pun the pun there. Uh, so it is quite a big bioinformatic challenge dealing with all this. Uh, initially, I was really excited, of course, to apply uh, some of these uh, tool sets to understand SARS-CoV-2 SARS evolution. Now I'm pretty overwhelmed by it all. But it's still quite an exciting field to work in, of course and hopefully has real world application. And the particular subfield that I'm really interested in is something called phylodynamics. What is phylodynamics, you might ask? Well, phylodynamics is interaction between evolution and epidemiology. So on the virus genome, um, the epidemiology of the outbreak really does imprint itself um, there. So phylogenies are very much shaped by the epidemiology, which is really exciting. And really it's a fusion of phylogenetics and population biology. Uh, one key approach is using patterns of coalescence to provide evidence for population size through time. And this is basically just a generalization of the right Fisher uh, theory, which I'll explain in a second. So of course, lots of this is gonna be uh, familiar to lots of you, but just to give some our background, of course, the coalescent is an important part of this story. What the coalescent is, is a model of ancestral relationships of a sample of individuals taken from a larger population. Um, the probability distribution of ancestral genealogies, so trees, given a population history, which we consider NT, um, is as follows. So the coalescent can convert information from ancestral genealogies into information about population history and vice versa. And in the Bayesian setting, it can be thought as, of as priors on the tree, which is really important. And lots of the analysis uh, I, I will show you relies on uh, Bayesian data analysis, also maximum likelihood, of course, as well. All uh, right, Fisher, just giving again, lots of you are very familiar with this, so I won't spend much time. But Wright Fisher is obviously central in uh, theoretical population genetics and basically this idealized model of population evolution. 
It assumes a constant population size uh, through time, which we know for SARS-CoV-2 is in the case. Um, there's discrete generations, of course, which also doesn't quite work in the virus setting, and assumes a uh, constant mixing as well. Of course, um, lots of these assumptions have been relaxed with uh, more modern takes on Wright Fisher. And here we assume that the population uh, is haploid, as the case is for many pathogens, including coronaviruses. And it also, the particular flavor of coalescence we are particularly going to be talking about today is Kingman's N coalescence. So basically, we consider tracing the ancestry of a sample of K individuals from the present back into the past. So in this case, down the bottom of the screen would be uh, the infections we see now. And going up the screen uh, goes back in um, generations back through time all the way to the consistor, which is the black dot on top. This is how the, the process always just eventually coalesces to a single common ancestor or consistor. And Kingman's coalescent and coalescent describes the statistical properties of such an ancestry when K is really small compared to the total population size uh, N. So we can first, we can consider two random members of a population of fixed size N. And by perfect mixing, the probability they share a consistor in the previous generation is just simply one over N. So the probability of consistor is T generations back can be put in uh, this particular equation. So the probability of uh, T equals one over N to one minus one over N uh, to T minus one. With K lineages, the time to the first coalescence is derived the same way. Now only there are K choose two possible pairs that may actually coalesce, resulting in a success rate um, of lambda equals K choose two over N. And a mean time to first coalescence, so we can denote this as TK, being N over K choose two. This is Kingman's coalescent. And for a, gene for a genealogy with known coalescent times, uh, T2, T3 to Tn, we can write the likelihood as uh, follows. So looking at uh, the time from present to past. And of course, many epidemiological agents such as RNA viruses, which coronavirus is one of, evolve very rapidly. So the effect of sampling the population at different times becomes really important. Of course, so we don't just sample all the viruses at once, of course, you sample as the uh, pandemic has progressed. Uh, and based on these patterns, we can actually tell about um, what's happening to viral population size over time. Okay, so these uh, particular dot plots are the key way to show how this particularly works. So lines um, going back through time, these are the samples we just collected, the red dots so they're the tips effectively, with the yellow dots being the nodes. You can see the shape of the um, of the coalescence through time really does um, show and come out in the actual tree itself. So you can see for a constant size, you've got the nodes um, being far back from the tips. So there's a few generations back from the tips. We get this lovely constant size. If you get something with exponential growth, we get quite a different pattern with the nodes being very close to the tips, as you can see here. So the red dots are quite close to the yellow dots if you get an exponential growth pattern. So basically the key message here is the pattern of population size through time imprints itself onto the trees just as follows, which is really useful if you try and reconstruct uh, epidemiological dynamics. And you get these particular plots. Uh, these are called skyline plots often. Uh, they can look like skyline, I guess, through time. Um, basically, what they show in effect is uh, coronavirus genetic diversity or virus diversity through time in this context, with some error of uh, some error around that particular estimate. So you can see down here, you've got time. I think this is for like maybe uh, West Nile virus, perhaps. Uh, you can see that diversity through time it casts spikes close to uh, year 2000 in this case. And this is just the y-axis in this setting is actually just a 
um, estimate of uh, population size, viral population size through time, and basically should be considered as relative diversity. So, of course, we can use this to better understand SARS-CoV-2. So viruses always mutate, of course. So when the viral enters your cell, um, basically breaks in, it harnesses the cell structures to create many replicates of itself. During this replication process, mutations occur. Um, lots of these mutations get lost out of the population because they either lead to death of the viron or um, allows the viron not to transmit properly, for example. But some mutations do go forward and do get picked up by the population in general. And for SARS-CoV-2, we get uh, roughly one mutation every two weeks, to put this into context. SARS-CoV-2 is actually considered quite slowly evolving on the virus spectrum um, compared to, say, influenza, which would be one mutation every couple of days, just to put in some context. But of course, not all, not all mutations are equal, and some in particular regions of the SARS-CoV-2 genome are more worrying than others. And in particular, um, people developing vaccines are really interested and really worried about uh, mutations in the spike protein, because often the spike protein, which allows the virus to enter the cell, uh, is a key target for uh, vaccine research. So changes in that particular region may, for example, make a vaccine um, less useful. So that's one reason why we have to keep tracking uh, these viruses through time, but they also offer ways to understand uh, pandemic uh, structure and trajectory. So back all the way back in February, March, we started just getting enough mutations to start getting estimates of the chain number of changes through time. So back in December, of course, early in the pandemic, there was enough mut mutations to really be sure about the rate of mutations through time. So it took a little bit of time for every March uh, before there was enough um, signal, temporal signal in the data to really start some of these phylogenetic approaches. That's convenient because that's when I actually started uh, looking at the sequences. Of course, um, mutations can be non-synonymous versus synonymous, so they can change the structure of the protein if they're synonymous. If they're non-synonymous, sorry, if they're synonymous, uh, they lead to no um, actual change in the protein structure, perhaps. And these changes, of course, can lead to distinct strains. Uh, strain here is actually quite a problematic concept. I'll just try to stay away from it because in the biological literature, it's very, um, very controversial. So I'm going to use lineage, uh, but just keep in mind they're kind of strains, I guess. But we're going to talk about lineages. Um, of SARS-CoV-2. And a key question back in March was how many statistically significant lineages um, of COVID were there or are there? And do these lineages show different population size trajectories through time? Or is it all pretty similar across lineages? These are the two uh, guiding questions in this particular paper. And what made this possible, of course, were well, all these freely available genomes, which you can look at yourself on something called NextStrain. I'll give you some, um, some, I'll give you a little mini guide to how to do that in a second. But freely available sequences definitely made this possible and allowed us to do this analysis on a truly global scale using sequences across the world. So what I did is download about 778 genomes on the 24th of March. That was most of them back then. Um, I did then align them, of course, using MAFT. I manually fixed reading frame issues. Uh, this took a lot of time. Mike and I just went through and fixed issue after issue, but eventually we got it just right. Once we're happy with the alignment, then we checked the temporal signal uh, in the data, so looking at mutations through time. Uh, there's a few outliers here, which uh, probably represented um, sequencing problems, so we removed some of those. And then we constructed a by ML, so maximum likelihood tree, uh, with a substitution model selection uh, done and followed by some Bayesian estimation as well. For the time trees, uh, so putting the trees in time, I used beast, a beast approach and tree data to scale branch lengths, basically, and estimate the most recent common ancestor uh, for SARS-CoV-2. 
once I'd done all those things, then I could actually do some analyses. And I did two analyses, basically. So one, I used something called tree structure. And tree structure is a non-parametric test, which contrasts estimated phylogenies with theoretically expected uh, phylogenetic ordering of common ancestors to look at how many particular lineages of clades uh, exist within this coalition, um, coalescent framework. And it asks the question, um, if you've got two clades there, do they have distinctive coalescent processes? So do we get within one clade, for example, do we get this uh, growth, exponential growth rate through time? Or is it flat for another lineage while well, another one is expanding? So you can get at these clade or lineage specific uh, characteristics. But of course, we need to know how many there are before we can do that. So basically the algorithm looks for uh, differences in the distribution of branch lengths um, compared to a null and looks at how many potential differences we could have uh, across a phylogeny. And it's a really useful screen for phylogenetic trees uh, to see if there's any distinctive clades that are likely to share distinct demographic and, in this case, epidemiological history. And this is developed by uh, Eric and Xavier um, and is published a while ago, um, I think in virus evolution as well. So once we were able to identify um, how many potential lineages there were and put some uh, statistical support behind that number of clades, then we could look at the particular population processes within each of those clades. And we use something called sky growth, which was also developed by um, Eric and Xavier as well. So sky growth are Bayesian non-parametric models quantifying changes in population size through time. Uh, Skyline, which I talked about previously, um, follows with population size, follows the stochastic process, such as boundary motion. The particular one we used here was sky growth, which is an autoregressive stochastic process defined on the growth rate of effective population size. So, this, so Skyline shows you basically the overall diversity through time, but sky growth looks at the particular growth in that particular pattern through time. And with Skyline estimates, when you see Skyline plots, I often see the stabilizing um, through time, so this kind of plateau through time. And they're not as likely to pick up declines in genetic diversity uh, through time. So sky growth has a big advantage. It can pick, pick these uh, quite subtle shifts in um, declining population sizes. And what model we actually chose and uh, the characteristics of the model were really important because back in March this year, there wasn't actually much diversity around. So we remember, remember we just crossed this threshold for some of these analyses. So there still wasn't much diversity, enough to work with, but not a huge amount because of, obviously it was quite a recent outbreak back then. But that said, even though there was much diversity around, we clearly were able to find three distinct lineages. So three lineages with likely different coalescent processes underlying them. Um, so we had lineage C, B and A. Okay, and we'll talk about these uh, in detail in a second. Uh, based on our time, uh, time tree analysis, we're able to place the most recent common ancestor uh, in November 2019 with some confidence intervals stretching from uh, early November to early December 2019. So that was promising. That's what the epidemiology says. That's when we know the outbreak happened. It was always good just to see that from the sequence data, we could um, get a reliable estimate of that particular start date. So three lineages through time. If we just looked at the global patterns of growth rate and effective population size through time, we found some quite interesting patterns, of course. So this is with all lineages together, just looking at the tree, um, looking at the patterns, the growth rate patterns and effective population size through time. The next slides, I'll show you the lineage specific ones. So if you look at the estimates for sky growth, we see that you get this little period of stability early in the pandemic and then it takes off, of course, um, in China, which makes sense. You've got this little period of rapid incline or rapid growth, followed by uh, basically what we consider as Chinese control. So as soon as China started getting controlling, uh, control of the virus back in um, 
mid-January, we could see this um, impacting the signature of um, the genomes as well, genome evolution. So, which is really exciting. We were really excited to see this. We got this period of growth, period of growth and growth in the growth rate, which is a bit of a tongue twister, followed by this decline um, associated with control in Wuhan. Of course, this control uh, in China uh, lasted for quite a while, but then led to outbreaks elsewhere and actually led to an outbreak in late February in Europe. You see this little spike here. We get this extension of growth rate, um, which we very sure actually lines very closely to the first European wave and then kind of stabilized since. <coughs> we haven't got very many sequences here, so we have less um, less confidence in the more recent ones. So again, the growth rate enabled us to look at these patterns of growth and decline, where if we just looked at effective population size through time, using a more traditional skyline approach, we see this plateau basically. So we see this growth in uh, viral diversity followed by, um, followed by a bit of a plateau. You do get this minor increase that's not as pronounced as you get in the growth models. So that was quite exciting. If we look at the individual lineages themselves, we see, again, quite distinctive patterns as well and differences between um, the growth rate versus coalescent estimates. So on this particular screen, we have the uh, growth rate estimates on the right over here, and we've got the, um, the skyline plots uh, themselves, which just talk about effective population size on the left. We've got lineage A, B, and C with different colors. So the two blues and the red down the bottom. So for lineage A, um, quite interestingly, it follows um, pretty similar uh, form to what we saw in the global analysis with all lineages together. So you get this uh, gradual accumulation of genetic diversity followed by a bit of plateau. And this particular lineage represents the origin. This is the original lineage that came out of Wuhan um, early in the pandemic. This is lineage A, and we'll talk about this in a second in more detail. That was the ancestral form, we think, of the virus. The virus uh, which crossed over from perhaps pangolins, from bats, wherever, I'm not going to speculate where, uh, but this is the virus that crossed over most likely from, um, from animals, wild animals, into humans. And you see, it follows this quite similar trajectory to what we saw in the global analysis. And he's saying with side growth, we see this increase in the growth rate associated with uh, the first wave through Wuhan, followed by decline when the Chinese were able to control it in Wuhan. So it's really exciting that we were seeing this control uh, signature here, followed by the increase with Europe, but not very much so. This makes sense because um, you'll see with other lineages, we get a much bigger expansion. Lineage B, um, this is also a co-circulating lineage. We don't think it's the original um, lineage, but it's another lineage that developed quite early on, particularly probably in this big spike of diversity when Wuhan was going initially. We think that two lineages, uh, well, a lineage broke away from lineage A, so lineage B broke away from A, went through a period of growth and then stability as well. If you look at the growth rate itself, the growth rate declined after it first came up. When I first separated from A, and it's gone through this kind of jagged um, pattern since then. Oh, whoops. And then with lineage C, we get um, the, a different pattern altogether. So we see, oh, oh, not different in some ways, similar in others, but we see this growth uh, really starting to happen in late February when the first European wave uh, came about, and then it's grown and uh, stabilized again more uncertainty there. Um, the growth rate again was high to start with and has declined through time. So we get this, I this idea, we get this kind of roller coaster ride of um, effective population size and growth rates through time. When you get a period of high growth, we get distinct lineages separating themselves during this growth rate, we think. And then they decline through time. The growth rate declines through time overall. So quite an interesting pattern we're getting amongst the lineages. And again, lineage A, that's ancestral lineage. Um, so the ancestral variant crossover from bats. Uh, it's actually very similar to um, a virus sampled in bats, so it's 96% similar. 
And the first cases in Australia were from this particular lineage. Now, we don't sample this particular lineage very frequently now. It is still co-circulating though. If you look at um, next strain, you do see um, some of this variant still circulating. It certainly hasn't gone extinct, that is for sure. Lineage B, in contrast, actually had slightly older sequences, but the ancestor most likely um, shows a clearly separate, separated away from lineage A. Um, so it's actually quite difficult to distinguish compared to, um, compared to C, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and phylogenetically, there's much more uncertainty in the tree as well, separating A and B. But again, they're co-circulating with not much diversity, but we do think they're a real thing. Um, other papers have seen similar patterns as well. Um, there's some non-synonymous mutations here, uh, which separate lineage B from A, but we're really quite unclear about our differences in function. It doesn't seem to be any more transmissible or any more deadly, um, but there is definitely some non-synonymous mutations uh, associated with this particular lineage. And interestingly, the Australian cases from the Ruby Princess and from Iran came from this particular lineage. Okay, so uh, in Australia, this particular lineage is quite important and then expanded across the world. There's even a possibility um, that it could have partially originated from the Ruby Princess. But that's uh, up for much, much debate. And of course, lineage C, perhaps the most interesting one, because uh, it's definitely the European up and comer. Okay, so this, as I mentioned, came about this, um, these particular mutations came about in Europe, not in China. This is definitely a European uh, lineage. So uh, it evolved in late February, again, with that first wave. And the first sequences we detected from this particular lineage came from Bavaria. Then quite rapidly, we saw it in Italy, in Spain, and now um, it's everywhere across the world. In fact, it's the most dominant lineage uh, today. If you see, if you just sequence anyone with an infection, you're more likely to pick up this particular lineage. It is everywhere and potentially more human adapted, perhaps. It's certainly more transmissible. Interestingly, um, all the way back in March, we were able to identify it um, as something separate to the other lineages. And it's been shown in subsequent laboratory analysis that this lineage is much more transmissible, not any more deadly, but more transmissible than the other lineages, particularly because it's got this mutation in the spike protein in, and in this region called the off one ab which is non-synonymous um, and is linked to higher transmissibility. It allows that viron to enter the cell more rapidly, perhaps. Okay, so it's really cool that we can detect this just from sequence data alone without any lab work, but these techniques allowed us to quite quickly pick out that this was different, this is going to be important, um, and we nearly did it in real time, I guess. So only literally a month after the first sequences were available. We knew there's something different about this and had quite a different phylogenetic signature. Uh, so if you want to look at... Um, these sequences, of course, you can. I highly recommend uh, going on to Next Strain. It's an amazing resource to watch virus evolution happening and uh, more phylogenetic um, innovations needed to deal with uh, this particular issue. And just amazing, you could waste weeks and weeks and weeks just looking at different patterns of evolution um, across the world. Uh, it's a brainchild of Trevor Bedford. He works at Fred Hutch in his lab. They did some of the um, phylogenetics underpinning all this. If you want to have a look for yourself, you can uh, look up Next Strain in Google, then you click on the global analysis for COVID-19, and you can scroll down to the diversity panel. And this shows you the SNP distributions across the genome. You can check out the tree, of course, and you can look at the particular mutation which separates uh, lineage A and B and C uh, at about the 24,000 base pair mark. Uh, so this just separates lineage C, sorry. So, Orange in this case, in this figure here, is lineage C. Um, you can see it's now everywhere in the world, and you can look at that particular mutation uh, just by scrolling down and seeing it right um, here. You see that nice little spike here in the diversity uh, plot. That's in the spike protein, which is classified as S here. And this mutation 
has led to much higher transmission across the globe. And our phylogenetic uh, pathway, uh, analysis pathway, was able to pick this up quite quickly. Anyway, so what does this all mean? So phylogenetic patterns within a pandemic can provide really important insights into the trajectory of that particular pandemic or outbreak. And I think even today, even though this analysis is slightly old now, there's still only three main lineages uh, to keep track of. So whether the evolutionary rate of the virus has changed and declined, I think it has, but it'd be interesting to check. Uh, it seems to be quite stable now, at least anyway, three main lineages. We know sky growth models capture the uh, pandemic characteristics well, but I think sky um, grid is also quite useful, Look, just looking at uh, genetic change accumulated through time. And we can see that control strategies can impact the signature. We can see control happening in China, particularly, and what impact that had on uh, sky growth uh, models, which is quite exciting. Of course, there's still much work to go, uh, many more bioinformatic challenges. But I think it's quite an exciting time to do phylogenetics of the virus in this case. So what I want to do next is repeat the process using alignment of a subsample of some of the 200,000 genomes. Um, I'm not sure how many thousand I can do, but we'll see how we go. And I want to compare our patterns from Australia, Taiwan, New Zealand, or South Korea, where uh, the virus has definitely been controlled. And I want to compare this to areas where there's less control, such as the US and the UK. Well, I mean, less, I no control, uh, given what we've seen recently. And seeing if we can see that signature of control on the phylogenetics of the virus. Even Hobart, there's quite an exciting, uh, exciting possibility because of the 230 cases detected in Tasmania, we've got about 206 full length genomes from those cases. So we can reconstruct the Tasmanian outbreak in pretty exquisite detail. That's what I hope to do in the next couple of months. I think it's quite exciting. Using this sequence data to understand outbreak dynamics. Happy to talk to anyone about, um, about um, how these techniques can be used. Happy to hear about ideas, about other analysis tools we could use to track evolution of these viruses. And with that, thank you very much.